I'm Dr. Mark Attala, and I want to welcome you to the third chapter of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. Today we'll be discussing biopsychology, which is human genetics, cells and parts of the nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and the endocrine system. And I want to start this chapter by making it clear that I'm going to mispronounce everything because biopsychology is not my field. But I'm trying, folks. I'm trying. Let's start by talking about human genetics. So the chapter begins by discussing the sickle cell and how it is believed to provide some protection from malaria. But it moves on to the theory of evolution by natural selection. And that, again, that picture is of Charles Darwin. This theory is that organisms that are better suited for their environment will survive and reproduce. Now, this is related to things like chromosomes, which are long strings of DNA. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce what DNA stands for. Sequences of, DNAs, of DNA make up genes, which may have multiple alleles. And an allele is a specific version of a gene. A person's genotype is their genetic makeup, where a phenotype is all their observable inherited physical characteristics. So a good example of this is flamingos. We think of them as being pink, but that's not encoded in the genotype. The food that they eat makes their phenotype either white or pink, which is how we see them. Let's talk about dominant versus recessive genes. A cleft chin is a dominant trait, and having one dominant allele from either parent gives you a cleft chin. So that's me, and I have a cleft chin, and I seem to be upset about something. There's, uh, you can have heterozygous or homozygous, and if you have two copies of the same allele, that's homozygous, and when you have a combination of different alleles for a gene, it's said to be heterozygous. Now, many genetic disorders are caused by pairing recessive genes. So, for example, sickle cell anemia or PKU. And I'm not going to try to pronounce what that stands for. Most traits, though, are polygenetic, which means that they're controlled by more than one gene. You can also have a mutation, which is a sudden permanent change in a gene. And so, for example, blue eyes. So 50,000 years ago, nobody had blue eyes. No humans had blue eyes. And now lots of people have them. And there's actually a sex selection bias for lighter eyes of about 3% per generation, which is enormous. What is range of reaction? Well, this is the idea that our genes set the boundaries within which we can operate. So this, if you're in a stimulating environment, you can reach your full potential. But you're in, if you're in a deprived environment, you wouldn't. The genetic environmental correlation is this idea that the genes in the environment influence each other bidirectionally. So for example, baseball players, the best predictor of whether you'll be a professional baseball player is whether your father was a professional baseball player. Epigenetics is how the same phenotype can be expre expressed in different ways. And you can look at this with identical and fraternal twins. Identical twins are always interesting uh, because they have the same genotype also. So one twin might develop cancer while the other does not. So the phenotypes differ as a result of how the genetic information is expressed over time. So Genes are also associated with temperament and mental disorders. So things like depression and schizophrenia. And specifically for schizophrenia, research suggests that both genetic vulnerability and environmental stress are necessary for it to develop. Well, let's switch gears and start talking about neuron structure. Now, the nervous system has two types of cells, glial cells and neurons. Glial cells provide the scaffolding that the nervous system is built on, and they help neurons to line up closely for neuronal communication, while also providing insulation for neurons and transporting nutrients and taking away waste products. Neurons serve as interconnected information processors. Uh, and then we have a graph here to the side, or um, a figure to the side. 
the nucleus of the neuron is the soma or cell body. And then the dendrites serve as input sites for signals coming from other neurons. The axon ends in multiple terminal buttons and those house neurotransmitters. And those are the, the neurotransmitters are the chemical messengers of the nervous system. And then the synapse is the space between neurons where the actual communication occurs. And let's talk about that. The neuron exists in a fluid environment, and that's both literal and figurative. Now, in a resting state, sodium is at higher concentrations outside of the cell, so it'll tend to move into the cell. Potassium is more concentrated inside of the cell. So when the neuron receives signals at its dendrites, gates open in the neural, neuronal membrane, which allows sodium ions to move into the cell, making the cell more positive. And this is the threshold of excitation, when the neuron becomes active and the action potential begins. Now at the peak of the spike, the sodium gates close and the potassium gates open and the cell quickly begins repolarization. The positive spike is the action potential, which uh, goes from the cell body to the axon to the terminals. And this action potential is an all or none phenomenon. So a cell fires or it doesn't. So it's like when you have a text or an email, nothing happens until you hit send and then there's no stopping it and there's no recalling it either. Neurotransmitters and drugs. So there is a biological perspective and this is that there's physiological causes of psychological disorders. And so we can try to treat the symptoms through psychotropic medications, which are used to restore this neurotransmitter balance. Now we can have agonists versus antagonists. An agonist is a chemical that mimics a neurotransmitter at the receptor site and strengthens its effect. An antagonist blocks or impedes the normal activity of a neurotransmitter. So for example, Parkinson's disease and dopamine agonists. Now Parkinson's is associated with low levels of dopamine. So dopamine agonists are one treatment strategy for people with Parkinson's. Depression is commonly treated with SSRIs, which stand for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And that's uh, sold as things like uh, Prozac, Paxil, and Zoloft. And LSD also has a similar structure to serotonin and affects the same neurons and receptors. Uh, it's important to point out, though, individuals vary um, widely in their response to these drugs. And so that needs to be mentioned also. The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system connects the central nervous system to the rest of the body. The peripheral nervous system is also divided into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Now the somatic nervous system is under conscious or voluntary control and it consists of motor neurons which are efferent and that means that motor neurons carry instructions from the central nervous system to the muscles, and efferent means moving away from, and sensory neurons, or afferent, um, which means that they carry sensory information to the central nervous system, and afferent means moving towards. The autonomic is involuntary, and we're talking about internal organs and glands. And it's divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, which uh, the sympathetic system prepares the body for stress-related activities, and the parasympathetic system returns the body to routine operations. So the, the systems have complementary functions and operate to maintain homeostasis or balance. So it's like an equal, homeostasis is like an equilibrium. So you want to keep your body temperature at 98.6 at biological optimal levels. Related to this too is the fight or flight response. And so if you're in some um, frightening or stressful situation, you get access to energy reserves, heightened senses. Um, it's all part of the symp sympathetic nervous system, um, which gets activated. 
And so your pupils dilate, your heart rate and blood pressure increase, and adrenaline is released. Now, this isn't helpful in the modern world. We're not usually chased by saber-toothed tigers in the real world uh, or in the current world, but um, we still have this fight or flight response. The spinal cord connects the brain to the outside world. Now the top of it merges with the brain stem and um, it's in, involved in breathing and digestion where basic processes of life are controlled. The spinal cord ends just below the ribs, not at the base of the spine. A lot of people think it goes all the way down. It's organized into 30 segments and those correspond to vertebrae, which are in the chart uh, to the right. Some sensory messages are immediate responses by the spinal cord, and so there's no input from the brain. And these are uh, reactions like reflexes, like withdrawal from heat and the patella or knee jerk um, response. In terms of damage, the lower the spine is damaged, uh, the fewer functions an injur injured individual loses. So in terms of possible injury, the lower the better. Let's talk about the two hemispheres. We have the cerebral cortex, and that's an uneven, the uneven surface of the brain, and it has uh, patterns of folds and bumps known as gyri and grooves called sulci. I'm not sure I'm saying those correctly. The longitudinal fissure is the deep groove that separates the brain into two hemispheres, and that's the pr most prominent sulcus or groove. Lateralization is specialization of function that occurs in each hemisphere, and that's mainly in regard to language ability, which we'll talk about later. But it's important to keep in mind that the left hemisphere controls the right half of your body, and the right hemisphere controls the left half of your body. The corpus callosum is a thick band of neural fibers that connects the two hemispheres, and in some cases of severe epilepsy, it's severed and that's to control the spread of seizures, uh, but it results in split brain patients who they sometimes do studies on too, because um, it's pretty interesting what that uh, creates. The forebrain is the largest part of the brain consisting of the two hemispheres, the cerebral cortex and numerous subcortical structures such as the thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and the limbic system. The cerebral cortex, which is the outer surface, is associated with higher level processes such as consciousness, thought, emotion, reasoning, language, and memory. And there's four lobes in the brain too. And we'll start with the frontal lobe, located in the forward part of the brain, hence the frontal lobe. And it extends back to a fissure known as the central sulcus. It is involved in reasoning, motor control, emotion, and language, and also contains the motor cortex, which is involved in planning and coordinating movement, uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is higher level functioning, and Broca's area, which is involved in language production. So people with Broca's aphasia have uh, trouble producing language. Uh, it's what's called non-fluent aphasia. Phineas Gage is an interesting example, uh, and he had frontal lobe damage from an accident. He's actually holding the tamping rod that went through his head. So he was working on a railroad all the live long day, and they were he was putting, um, they drill a hole and then they fill it with gunpowder, and it, they're essentially blasting rock. and the tamping rod is what he's holding there. They use it to push down the gunpowder into the hole. Two of, some of his men were fighting. They were arguing with each other. And he turned his head to yell at them. And the tamping rod created a spark, which blew it up into the air through his head. And it landed 80 feet away. Um, if you, it's amazing. It happened in 1848. Before the accident, he was said to have been well-mannered and soft-spoken, but after the accident, and he was conscious, he was taken to the doctor immediately afterwards, and he says, he said to the doctor, here's some business for you, because he had this tamping rod go through his head. It's three feet long. I guess you can't really see that in the picture. Afterwards, though, he began to behave in odd and inappropriate ways. 
These behavior changes would be consistent with a loss of impulse control, which is a frontal lobe function. Uh, what people said, not to go into this too much, but people said he just wasn't gauge. He just wasn't himself anymore. However, there's some evidence that the personality changes that occurred in Phineas Gage were exaggerated and embellished for effect. And so there's that. The parietal lobe is located Im immediately behind the frontal lobe, and it involves uh, it's involved in processing information from the body's senses. It contains the somatosensory cortex, which is essential for processing sensory information from across the body, such as touch, temperature, and pain. The temporal lobe is located on the side of the head uh, near the temples, which is what temporal means, and is associated with hearing, emotion, and some aspects of language. The auditory cortex uh, is located within the temporal lobe, as well as Wernicke's area, which is important for speech comprehension. So a person with damage to Wernicke's area can produce uh, language, but they're unable to understand it. And this is also known as receptive or fluent aphasia. The occipital lobe is located at the very back of the brain and contains the primary visual cortex, which is responsible for interpreting visual information. It's organized retinotopically, meaning that there's a close relationship between the position of an object in the visual field and that object's representation on the cortex. Other areas of the forebrain, well, there's the thalamus, which is a sensory, a sensory relay for the brain in which all of our senses except smell are routed before being directed to other areas for further processing. The limbic system is involved in processing both emotion and memory. And so your sense of smell also projects to the limbic system. Um, this is one of the reasons why smells can evoke uh, emotional responses that other sensory modalities can't, or at least don't. The hippocampus is an essential structure for learning and memory. Uh, the amygdala in, is involved in our experience of emotion and emotional meaning in memories, and is there twice. The hypothalamus regulates a number of homeostatic processes, including the regulation of body temperature, appetite, and blood pressure. Let's talk about the case of Henry Moliason, uh, if I'm saying that correctly. Now, he was a 27-year-old man who experienced severe seizures, so to try to control them, he underwent brain surgery to remove his hippocampus and amygdala. After the surgery, his seizures became much less severe, but he also suffered some unexpected consequences. He lost his ability to form many types of new memories. For example, he was unable to learn new facts, such as who was the president of the United States. However, he could learn new skills, like using a computer, but he would have no conscious memory of ever having used a computer, but he was able to use it. So that's interesting. Let's talk about midbrain structures. So the midbrain is comprised of structures located deep within the brain, between the forebrain and the hindbrain. The reticular formation is centered in the midbrain, extending up into the forebrain and down the hindbrain, and it's important in regulation of the sleep-wake cycle, arousal, alertness, and motor activity. The substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area are also in the midbrain, and both regions contain cell bodies that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine and are critical for movement. The hindbrain is located at the back of the head and really looks like an extension of uh, the spinal cord. It contains three structures, the medulla, pons, and cerebellum. The medulla controls automatic processes such as breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. The pons, which literally means bridge, serves to connect the brain and spinal cord and is involved in regulating the brain during sleep. The cerebellum, or little brain, uh, receives messages from muscles, tendons, joints, and structures in our ear to control balance, coordination, and movement. 
It's also thought to be involved in memories for how to perform tasks, which is probably why HM, who we just talked about, could learn new tasks, even though he couldn't remember having learned them. How do we image the brain? Well, a couple different ways. Let's start by talking about computerized tomography or CT scans. And that involves taking a number of x-rays of a particular section of a person's body or brain. So the x-rays pass through the tissues of various densities at different rates. That constructs an overall image of the area of the body being scanned. And it's often used when someone has a tumor or brain atrophy. Positron emission tomography, or a PET scan, uh, is used to create images of the living, active brain. So an individual getting a PET scan drinks or injects a mildly radioactive substance called a tracer, which can be monitored in the body. Uh, so as areas of the brain become more active, more blood flows to that area, and that comes out on um, the screen. This technique, because it involves exposing the brain to radiation, um, it's not really done uh, very much anymore. It's mostly been replaced by fMRIs, which we'll talk about next, which is using magnetic fields. So magnetic resonance imaging, or an MRI, involves using, machine, using a machine that generates a strong magnetic field. The field causes the hydrogen atoms in the body cells to move. Actually, it makes them spin all in the same direction. And then when the magnetic field is turned off, the atoms emit signals as they return to their original positions and the computer detects and interprets that movement and that's how you get um, the image. Functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRIs operates similarly to an MRI but it shows changes in brain activity over time by tracking blood flow and oxygen levels. And so it provides a more detailed image of the brain structure with better accuracy than a PET scan does. Because of their high level of detail, fMRIs are often used to compare the brains of healthy individuals to those uh, diagnosed with psychological disorders. Electroencephalography, or EEGs, give insight into the overall functioning of a person's brain by providing a measure of a brain's electrical activity. So an array of electrodes is placed on the head and you can see the young person wearing that on their head uh, to the right. And signals received by the electrodes result in a printout of the electrical activity of the individual's brain waves, showing both frequency and amplitude of the waves. Now this is largely used uh, to study sleep patterns among people with sleep disorders, because they can just wear that on their head and be monitored. Let's finish out by talking about the endocrine system. And this is a series of glands that produce hormones, which are secreted into the bloodstream and travel throughout the body. Now, hormones are involved in regulating all kinds of body functions and are ultimately controlled through the interaction of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Now the pituitary gland descends from the hypothalamus at the base of the brain and acts as the master gland for hormone control and uh, with the other glands of the endocrine system. It also secretes growth hormone and endorphins for pain relief. The thyroid gland releases hormones that regulate growth, metabolism, and appetite. And problems like hypothyroidism um, can make people feel tired and cold, but they're easily treated, um, or hypothyroidism is easily treated with medication. The other major glands are the adrenal glands, and they sit atop our kidneys and secrete hormones involved in the stress response, so epinephrine and norepinephrine. The pancreas is an internal organ that secretes hormones that regulate blood sugar levels. So you have insulin, which lowers blood, blood glucose levels, and glucagon, which raises them. People who do not produce enough insul uh, insulin have insulation. Insulin have diabetes. And my middle boy, my middlest boy, he was actually diagnosed with type one diabetes when he was 12. And we were actually happy to find that out because uh, he wasn't growing and he was losing weight and we, wasn't sh we weren't sure what was wrong with him or how to help him, but uh, diabetes is a very treatable um, illness. 
Uh, that's actually Wilfred Brimley in that picture there to the right. And he taught an entire generation of people to pronounce uh, diabetes, diabetes, because uh, so, that's the way he says it. The gonads uh, secrete sexual home hormones, which are important in reproduction and mediate both sexual motivation and behavior. The female gonads are the ovaries and the male gonads are the testes. So let's finish up by talking about solving all your problems, or at least all your APA problems can be solved through um, my book and videos about learning APA style. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my books and videos on Learn APA Style, which were about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Thanks for listening.